My name is Daniel Kalni. As I said, I'm from the Czech Republic and mostly I play with GA chips. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about how to program Greenery's chips using Etherforth running on a single GA144. Now let me start with a brief historical overview since Etherforth is not a new thing. Chuck Moore started its development around 2010 and within two years, Chuck developed code for Ether, memory and video controllers, and prototype of a simple compiler. And he also published many other interesting Ether code examples. Even if Etherforth development was discontinued at the end of 2012, Chuck had come up with most of the fundamental concepts that are employed in Etherforth. To satisfy my interest in Etherforce, Chuck gave me the latest version of his source code about three years ago. So I began studying his code and experimenting with it. And step by step, I found out how to implement Chuck's ideas into a self-contained development environment. I started with a USB keyboard controller presented at four day last year so that I would be able to interact easily with the system. And then other parts followed. And today I can present Etherforce as a complete development environment for Greenery's chips. So what is Etherforce? As defined by Chuck, from the very beginning, Etherforce is a variant of Colorforce running entirely in Greenery's chips. It exploits Ether, which is code that enables communication between nodes. Source code in Etherforce is composed of pre-parsed words identified by colored tags. But most importantly, it is a standalone system which needs no other computer or software. Etherforce is suitable for experimental work and for exploring GA chips. It can be used to develop educational, hobby and demo applications. On the other hand, as it is now a hobby project of mine itself, it is not intended for professional or business applications. Those should be developed with the official Greenery's tools. To run Etherforth, you need a suitable hardware. The easiest way is to work with a GA evaluation board, but any similar board with GA144 and SRAM can be used as well. Additional requirements are clock source, VGA display, USB keyboard, and dual voltage multimedia card. And standalone version, version of Etherforce uses also an onboard SPI uh, flash memory. Notice that Etherforce system runs in host chip only. The target chip is reserved for application code and it can be located on the same board or it can be external. The serial line and USB to serial converter as found on Eval board are needed for bootloading the system from a PC or for burning the system image into the SPI flash. When Etherforce is running, it does not need those anymore. Before we talk about Etherforce internals, let's refresh briefly two concepts. Ether is code that is used for routing messages between nodes. Ether is loaded into all nodes upon reset and nodes are left suspended in a multi-port execute state. We use ether to bootload nodes, in which case ether is overwritten with the new code, or for communication between nodes that are not adjacent to each other. Communication over ether is achieved by sending messages. They are composed of header, payload, and optional reply that is sent back using the same route. Message header is always four words long. It is composed of a focus, which is a call instruction to the port from which the message comes, address that points to an ether entry point, path that describes which nodes transfer the message, and counts that define length of payload and reply. Ether path may have up to three segments, and each segment is described by its length and direction where directions are physical directions, not port names. Counts are eight bits for payload and nine bits for reply. So that defines maximum payload and reply length in one message. 
The second concept is that of pre-parsed words. Any text, including source code, is composed of six-bit symbols. Symbols are either tags, characters, or tokens. And three symbols are packed into one 18-bit word. Tags characterize symbols that follow until the next tag. There are 16 tags, most of them with associated color. The first two tags define tokens, which are short strings representing F18 instructions, flow control words, and names of ports and registers. Using tokens makes source code more compact, and it also simplifies compiler, as we will see later. Now let's look at Etherforce floor plan. The whole system is implemented in 137 nodes of the host chip. The system is divided into modules distinguished by colors, which form more or less independent units. units. Modules communicate with each other via ports of adjacent nodes or using ether messages. I'm going to give a short description of each module now. Clock module provides timing signal necessary for keyboard and screen control. Video module generates RGB and synchronization signals for VGA screen. It includes block and command line buffers, token strings, character bitmaps, and definition of tag colors. It also generates a blinking cursor. Keyboard module is a low speed USB host, which detects a keyboard, initializes it, reads key scan codes and converts them into Etherforce symbols and control codes. SRAM module generates signal for external memory, packs and unpacks 18-bit data into and from 16-bit wide SRAM and provides several interfaces enabling other modules to access the external memory. Multimedia card module initializes MMC into SPI mode upon boot up and transfers whole blocks of data between MMC and SRAM. Editor is located between keyboard, video, and SRAM modules. It enables basic navigation and source code, edit, source code editing, and it also controls command line. Interpreter parses command line content and executes words defined in its dictionary. Together with editor, they form an interactive part of the system. Then there's a compiler module, which is called to compile one block of source code. It builds a small dictionary from definitions and compiles object code, which is delivered to the target node RAM, as well as initialization code that is executed at the target node port as the last step of node booting. Loader expands compiler functions. It interprets content of load blocks calling compiler for each application source block referenced therein. It can also load other load blocks and perform other actions with the target chip. Link node transfers object code to the target chip over service line and also allows system to get data from the target chip back. Together with loader and compiler modules, they form an engine for building applications. Then there are utilities module, in, uh, which includes several debug and development functions. And finally, there is an asynchronous serial node enabling system boot up from a PC, archiving and restoring MMC content and system development and testing. Etherforce does not use this node for normal operations. As mentioned earlier, many modules communicate with each other using ether messages. Here, each arrow indicates one message path from source to destination. From the very beginning, the intention was to make Etherforce resemble color force as much as possible. However, the very nature of GA chips leads to highly distributed code. For instance, from the user's perspective, there is one stack, although it is implemented in three separate nodes. Similarly, there's a dictionary implemented in four nodes. Most of the words are defined in one node only, but some words such as code and load or words controlling path uh, directions have to be defined in two different nodes. Another example of distributed code is an action 
such as deleting a word from source text. It is achieved by hitting a single key, which nevertheless activates many nodes simultaneously, although only a few words are executed in each node. Therefore, it is not practical to show and explain code of each and every node as the functionality of the system is based mainly on cooperation and interdependence of nodes. Instead, I'd rather show what Etherforce can be used for and with the help of simple applications, demonstrate how Etherforce internals work. So here's the Greenrace eval board EVB1 that I use with display and keyboard attached. These two small PCBs in the prototyping area are 3.3 and 5 volts regulators and voltage level shifter, which are needed for USB keyboard connection. With this setup and a few other components, I'm going to show some simple demo applications. And what simpler application can we start with than controlling an LED attached to the target chip's GPIO pin? So we power up the system, an intro screen shows up and a blinking cursor at the bottom of the screen indicates the system is ready. The green LED has been attached to the monitor frame so we can see when it turns on and off. Load block of the first demo application is block number 20. We open the block in editor and see that the application is implemented only in a node 500. Its source code is in block 22. So let's move to this block. There are two definitions, one to turn the LED on and the other to turn it off. In the initialization code, we can see that upon booting up, the node jumps toward on so that the LED turns on immediately. Let's leave the editor now, load the application, and watch the LED as it turns on. It takes a fraction of a second to load such a trivial application. However, there's a multitude of steps taking place and we'll go through most of them now with the help of this floor plan. A panel floating over the floor plan simulates the screen. We've already typed 20 load into command line and are about to hit the enter key. Doing so, the editor asks interpreter to start processing the command line. Interpreter sends requests to SRAM controller to reach into memory and fill a buffer in a node 308 with command line content. Then a node 408 scans through the buffer, extracts individual strings and sends them to node 409 for parsing. Notice that command line contains only white tags that separate individual strings, which means we don't use tags to distinguish between different types of strings in command line. This is task for parser, which uses simple rules. If the parsed string begins with a digit, it is a number and it is stored onto stack in node 509. Numbers are assumed to be in base 10 unless they start with zero, in which case base 16 is used for conversion. If the string starts with other character than digit, it is considered a word and it is searched for in a dictionary in a node 510. When found, node 410 starts execution of its associated code. In case of word load, we take the value from stack, build an ether message and send it to loader module. The interpreter then waits till it gets a reply from the loader. Loader module asks SRAM controller to reach into memory and fetch block 20. Then we start loading the block. Notice that the cursor disappeared from the panel. It is to indicate that what we see now is not the actual content of the screen. Rather, it is content of the block being delivered by SRAM controller to whichever module has requested it. Loader module is actually an interpreter which recognizes only two tags, yellow decimal numbers and yellow words. Other tags are ignored and 
they may serve as comments. Thus, we first recognize number four, which is pushed onto stack. The next one is word load. When found in dictionary and executed, it stops interpretation of block 20, keeps current block number and interpretive pointer position in a node 203. Then it pops number four from stack and builds an ether message requesting that block from SRAM. This demonstrates how block loading can be nested. Four levels on, of nesting are possible. It also shows that command load can be used both in command line as well as in load blocks. Block number four contains a special code that conditions the target chip. It resets the chip, waits till all pins settle to their reset state. Then it creates a service link between host and target by loading code into link node 001 of the target chip. And finally, it fills the rest of the target chip with ether. For the sake of simplicity, we'll skip details of block four. Instead, we will assume we've just loaded it so that the target chip is ready and we are about to unnest back to block 20. Block 20 is requested from SRAM module, which reaches into memory and sends the block content back. The interpretive pointer is placed where we left off and we continue loading from this block. Next recognized string is number 22, which is placed on stack. Then we recognize and execute word code. When executed, it stores current interpretive pointer position, takes number 22 from stack, builds another ether message and requests compiler to compile this block. By now we are leaving loader module, which is waiting for compiler result and we'll have a look at how compiler works. When asked to compile a source block, compiler requests this block from SRAM module, which reaches into memory and sends the block content to node 205. In this node, individual symbols are extracted from the source and sent to parser in node 105. The first thing parser does is reducing number of tags. Out of 16 tags, only few are relevant for compilation. First, there are two token tags, yellow and green. The only difference between them is that green tokens are used for code executed by the node itself, while code in yellow is compiled as data and will be executed in another node. Distinguishing the two types of tokens makes source code easier to read but from the compiler perspective, both are exactly the same. Therefore, we may combine the two tags into one. Next, we have yellow words, followed by yellow decimal and hex numbers, which are converted here into binary form. Therefore, only one tag for yellow numbers is sufficient. And similarly, two green number tags are combined into one. And then we have green and red words. These are tags understood by compiler. Meaning of those colors is the same as in color force. Red words start a new definition, green words are compiled and yellow are executed. Other colors are ignored and may serve as commands. A stream of simplified tags and associated data, which may be either token, number or string is sent to node 104, where we process data according to their tags. As I said earlier, using tokens simplifies compiler. All tokens are divided into three groups. There are tokens which uh, with one-to-one -one correspondence to F18 instruction, which means they are binary equivalent to their opcodes. Second group of tokens includes jump and loop instructions and flow control words. And finally, there is a group of tokens representing names of ports and registers. So let's have a look now at how different tags control the way source code is compiled. Tokens of the first type are simply written into the next available slot of the current instruction word in the node 102. Yellow numbers are executed. 
so their values are stored on compiler stack in node 002. Green numbers are compiled as literals. That is, fetchp instruction is compiled into the current instruction word, and value of the literal is stored in a temporary storage. When the instruction word is complete, it is written into image memory, followed by literal values temporarily stored in node 002. Compilation of red word starts by requesting node 102 to align instruction pointer to the next available address and send this address back to node 104. Then we use it as an execution address of a new entry in the dictionary that is being built in node 204. A green word is searched for in this dictionary and if found, a call to its execution address is compiled. In case a yellow word, uh, of a yellow word, we first search for it in the green dictionary and if found there, we place execution address of the word on compiler stack as if we use a tick preceding the word. If a yellow word is not found in the green dictionary, we search for it in yellow dictionary. There is a number of words defined there and yellow words are executed and they affect the different aspects of the compilation process. Now we consider tokens used as port and register names. They behave as green constants. Thus fetchp instruction is compiled and corresponding constant value is stored temporarily in node 002. Finally, jump and loop instructions are processed in node 103 and more complex flow control tokens, which are mostly a combination of simple jump and loop instructions and compiler stack manipulations are implemented by node 003. Both nodes affect state of nodes 102 and 002. We've already noticed that the heart of compiler is located in these two nodes. They contain instruction pointer, slot index, current instruction word, compiler stack, and temporary storage for literals, as well as destination address calculator and mechanism for creating and resolving forward references. When an instruction word is complete, it is sent to node 001, which places it either into an image memory in node 301, or into memory reserved for initialization code in a node 201. Node 001 also participates in resolving forward references made by flow control words. In case we come across a semicolon token, which represents written instruction, node 001 checks if the last instruction compiled has been a call. If not, we simply compile a written instruction into the current instruction word. Otherwise, we ask node zero to find this call in the object code memory and to replace the call instruction with a jump. This way, compiler implements tail recursion. The last word in the source code is always yellow word send, which expects a path to the target node on compiler stack and which asks node 101 to build an ether message with the code object code and send it over this line to the target node. Delivering object code is not a trivial task. After compiling an image and initialization code, we must move that code to the link node 701, then send it over this line to the link node 001 in the target chip then deliver that code to the target node port, load the image into target node RAM, and finally execute the initialization code. To this end, node 101 builds an ether message with a path leading to the link node 701. The first word of the payload is so-called link, which is actually a path from the link node 001 to the target node. Then there is loader, a short code that loads image into target node RAM, followed by the image itself and ending with the initialization code. When the message arrives at node 701, 
its host chip header is rearranged with the link content into a target chip header. And this updated message is sent over service line and the payload is delivered by ether at the target node port. Here, using port execution, we run loader, which fills target node RAM with the image. And finally, using port execution again, we run the initialization code. And from now on, the target node is booted up. In our little example, the source code block is exhausted by now. So the compiler informs loader that it compiled the block without any error and returns control to the loader. Loader requests the last load block used from SRAM controller, which reaches into memory and sends the block content to node 304. It then returns where it left off using the stored interpretive pointer location. And finding there is nothing more to be loaded, it sends reply to the interpreter. This is signal for the interpreter to clear the command line and send reply to editor that our request to load an application has been carried out successfully. This trivial example shows how an application is loaded in Etherforth. The process is the same for larger applications and may include a number of load and source blocks. Apart from interpreter and compiler, a decent fourth system should also implement some development tools. In Etherforce, we have two basic tools at our service. First one enables exercising a target node. Word hook sets a path to the target node and word run sends an instruction word that it finds on interpreter stack through service line and the path set with the word hook. So the instruction word is delivered to a target node port. Of course, using this tool assumes that the target node is executing from that port. Usually the instruction word contains a jump to a particular code in the target node RAM, but it can be basically any instruction word we like. Let's see how we can use these words in our first application. Path to node 500, which is four up, zero left and zero is encoded as 82. So we set that path with word hook. To execute word off, which begins at address two, we enter this code for jump instruction. Now with the LED as it turns immediately off when we execute command run. Of course, we can turn it back on using command run and jumping toward on located at address zero. Another useful tool allows target node examination. It's defined as word peer and it displays target node stack as well as content of its RAM. The word expects a path to the target node on interpreter stack. It takes the path, builds an ether message and sends uh, this message to the utility node 600, asking it to get the data. This node together with node 700 sends a message to the target node via service line where the message delivers code to its in its payload that reads content of target node RAM and stack and sends the content back to node 700 as ether reply. Now node 700 moves the data to node 500 where binary values are converted into hex numbers and formatted text is sent to node 106 which is adjacent to SRAM module interface. Node 106 fills block number one with the received stream of symbols as if they were entered with the editor. When the whole data is stored in block one, node 500 forces the video module to display content of this block. 
This way the user can inspect content of the target node. Let's peer into our application node with word peer. Again, we provide path to the target node as an argument. And using word peer, we immediately see the content uh, of nodes stack and RAM. And notice that the, the indicator in the bottom right shows block number one. The display shows stack content on top, starting from the left side with T and S registers, followed by the next four stack locations and displaying the remaining four stack locations from the right so that it mimics the circular stack architecture. Below the stack, memory content is shown. We can see compiled application code and empty RAM cells filled with multi-port call instructions. Until now, we've learned that SRAM is used to store source blocks. We've just seen that output of word peer is stored in block number one in SRAM. And we also know that command line content is stored somewhere in SRAM too. Therefore, it might be a good time to say a few words about data storage. There are basically three levels of data storage in Etherforce. First is a block buffer located in the video module. It has capacity of 218 bit words and its content is continuously read and displayed by the video module. Only during vertical synchronization pulse, the buffer is accessible to the rest of the system. The second level of data storage is provided by the external memory. All accessible SRAM is divided into 910 blocks. When we use editor to modify content of a block, each change is immediately copied from the block buffer into the appropriate block in SRAM. The set of all blocks in SRAM forms one virtual disk. And the third level of data storage uses multimedia card. The card holds 128 virtual disks. Users can choose which virtual disk they want to work with, copy its whole content or individual blocks into SRAM and store it back as a whole or as individual blocks. As indicated with darker background, blocks zero and one have special functions. Block zero is the very place where command line is stored. Using a block for this purpose enables reusing block editor code also for command line editing. You may have noted that when we enter text into the command line, the block number indicator displays zero. As for block one, we've already seen that it is used to store output of word peer. There are also virtual disks with dedicated use. Disk number zero is a working disk. It is copied into SRAM during boot up of the system. It is therefore useful to have the current project copied into this disk and have the whole project available immediately whenever we reset the system. Disk number one is used as a template for other disks. It includes only system blocks, such as block four for target chip conditioning, while other blocks are empty. And all remaining disks are free for user applications. For instance, disk two of my system includes all demo applications for this fourth day. And demo applications fills most, uh, fill most of the rest of this presentation. Looking at this diagram, one can think it would be nice if it were possible to use block one, not only for the system, but also for application feedback. Well, this option is also available. In the eval board, apart from service line, there is also another communication channel between host and target chips. That link is a synchronous serial line between the nodes 300 of the two chips. The Etherforce system uses this line as an application tool. Node 300 of the host chip listens to the sync serial line and sends whatever it receives from the target chip to node 400. It may be both code and data. There is code in node 400 opening a channel from node 500 to node 106. 
This channel is then used to send any stream of symbols, which is directly written into block number one. And then there is another code that closes this channel and forces video module to display the content of block one on the screen. Now, what application is used more often when we wish to demonstrate printing capability of a new language or a system than the famous Hello World? This application starts in block 30 and loading it, we get the greetings on the screen together with Etherforce character and token sets and all colors that the system can display. Noted that, notice that this printing utility can display 12 colors, including blue, which is not normally available in editor and even orange, which is reserved for cursor only. When I implemented this feature, I wondered why an application shouldn't be able to display different screens sequentially. And as we will see in the next demo application, this is also possible. This application is loaded from block 40. And what you see is the current local time at the moment of recording this video. The characters are the same as those used in the video module, except that each pixel is displayed as one hash character. Although it's fun to display big clock, there are more practical applications for this function. We may use it to design custom development tools. For instance, suppose we attach a sensor to the target chip and we want to see in real time what values the sensor reports. As an example, I have connected a potentiometer as a voltage divider to the input of an analog node 617. And I want to see what values the ADC reports and what is the voltage corresponding to the current ADC reading. To this end, the potentiometer is limited to the voltage span between 0.8 and 1.3 volts, where the ADC response is linear, as can be seen in the left graph taken from Green Array's data book. The right image shows calibration line determined from values measured on my system. The relationship is pretty linear except at higher voltage. Let's see how this application works. The application is launched from block 60 and we can see sample values from ADC in yellow, then voltage calculated with the help of linear function in white, and also a red bar graph showing the relative position of the potentiometer wiper. As we can see on the multimeter, the calculated voltage is accurate to about one tenth of volt and the higher error is apparent at the extremes of the range where the ADC response deviates from the linear one the most. The last demo application uses this potentiometer as a control element in a computer game. I simply could not resist to implement this game as a reminiscence of the famous Pong here in a single player version. This game starts in block 80. We can move the pedal with the potentiometer and the game counts successful hits with the green counter and missed balls with the red one. The refresh rate of the screen is nine FPS, which is limited only by the synchronous serial line speed and by the accessibility of block buffer in the video module. The animation may seem a bit choppy over zoom, but hopefully it hints what can also be done with Etherforce. And that was the last demo application.
If you are interested in knowing more, a website dedicated to Etherforce has been launch, launched uh, as of today. It contains detailed description of Etherforce system. It provides information on necessary hardware and gives full source code listing. You can also download source code in the form of Colorforce image file and compile it with Colorforce tools kindly provided by Green Arrays for download from their website. The source file also includes some tools written in Colorforce that could be helpful during system installation and enable system maintenance such as backup of MMC content. A user manual is still under preparation, but there's a brief installation guide on the website. Hopefully I'll be able to finish the manual by the end of this year. And then I would like also to add tutorials and code examples, including all demo applications you've seen today. Before the end of my presentation, I wish to thank two people without whom I would have never been able to make Etherforce what it is now. I'm very grateful to Chuck Moore for giving me his original Etherforce code and his permission to use it and publish it. I'm no less grateful to Greg Bailey, who has always been willing to answer my question, explain details of GA chips, and think about issues I stumbled upon during this work. He is the person I highly respect, and it's an honor for me to be his, to be his friend. So thank you, Chuck, and thank you, Greg. And thank you all for listening. <laughs>